Um, he's Professor David Gauntlet from Westminster University, um, and many of you will know um, that he's been one of the theorists who's listed the A-level the media specifications, which if you look at his blog, date.com, um, he's, he's blogged about it, he said that he's interested, he's curious about that, he wants to know what he's got to, what people think he has to say um, around identity and representation, because he's written about this but a long, long time ago, and his interests have been evolving ever since. The latest, the, the re, it's the, the, the latest edition of Making is Creating um, is the, the thing that you're kind of most engaged with at the moment, I, I guess. Um, the, the kind of creative explanation of play um, and the, the ways in which people um, use play and creativity in their everyday lives uh, to express the things that they're interested in. Um, and I think in, in some ways represents a bit of a, a challenge to the way that we've thought about media and media studies um, over the past 30 or 40 years. David did speak about Media Studies 2.0 in mean, about 2008-9 at one of the media conferences here. Um, and that all, and now sounds really out of date, 2.0, doesn't it? Because um, we stopped at that whole kind of number dot zero thing um, a while ago. But I, if, I just think that's on your, on your blog about the specification that you say, I've been put in a box not of my own making. Um, and as he keeps saying, while I'm still alive. So uh, we're going to hear from, uh, from David for about 40 minutes or so, and then we'll have a, a bit of a Q&A afterwards. But give a warm round of applause and welcome him to the stage. Thank you, everybody. Is this thing on as the same goes? I guess it is. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, so this is me. As Mark said, I have a website which has some stuff that may be useful. Obviously, at this point, you may not know whether you want to be looking at this, but maybe by the end you might have formed an opinion one way or the other. I'm on Twitter. I see that not many of the people at this conference seem to be tweeting with the hashtag at the minute. Has Twitter all died for you now? Is it Donald Trump that has killed that? <laughs> or, you know, I think, oh, you're probably on Snapchat or something, but actually you're, you're beyond that, aren't you? Because you're the crazy kids. You're on, you're on Limpet and Scuffle. I made those up, don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> they don't exist. Stop Googling Limpet. What's Limpet going to get on Limpet? <laughs> made that up. Um, so this morning, I, uh, on the train, I made this uh, Venn diagram. I nearly called it pie chart. It's a Venn diagram. Um, this is to show you what a tweet looks like, for those of you who don't know. Um, this is uh, what the PFI media conference people must have been thinking. You've got this chart. People who are named as media theorists in the new school curriculum. People they can't get hold of, and the largest one, people who are dead. Um, I'm not dead, but as I said in that blog post that Mark mentioned, some of you may wish I was, because the trouble with this is that um, I get written down. It's a weird thing. It's not a, this isn't like a general experience that everyone can empathize with. It's a weird thing where uh, you get written down in the national curriculum, and then you have to try to work out why they did that and what the thing is that they're talking about. That's what I'm going to be working through with you today. Um, You'd like to think, probably, that I would have the answers for you, which I don't necessarily. There was the bit that Mark said, which was that I would like to hear from you what you think I said about things. That sounds even worse, doesn't it? <laughs> I understand you might be thinking, can't he tell us? And I can try. Um, so that was that. I'm not going to do any more of those big swooshes. Don't worry for those of you who are complaining about being seasick. I don't believe anybody does get seasick from Brexit, but it's what people say. So this is what I'm talking about. Um, we've got, that was the title bit. That's the elephant in the room. It's not an elephant in the room. I've already mentioned it. It's an elephant you can see. The elephant in the room is the thing about the national curriculum and what the hell I'm doing on that. Um, then there's a bit about how we think about the internet now. And then there's the kind of stuff over on the right. That is the right. Uh, over on the right, which is the kind of things I like to talk about these days, which aren't necessarily the things that the national curriculum is talking about. Um, or the A-level specification. I always call it national curriculum. Is that the wrong phrase? Yes. It is? <coughs> Why is that? Does national curriculum stop at 16? Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> but it's the thing that you're told you have to be teaching about. That's what I think a national curriculum is. So it's it's, it's isn't it? More or less. Um, and then I'll try and link that back to what it is that the thing that I call the national curriculum uh, things that I'm talking about, and we can see if that seems to work in the Q and A session, which we're having after I've finished talking. Um, so that was the elephant. That's that thing. So I've only seen this thing, but then when I get here this morning, when there's specifications that have been written by the exam boards, where they flesh out what they think the people, whoever they were, were thinking when they wrote this, whoever they were, 
it's, it seems like a really weird process of kind of Chinese whispers of people who think they heard about a theorist who probably said something about something gets written down, then gets sort of retranslated by some other people, and then you're going to have to translate it against some students who then translate it into other words for it to get written down, and then processed by some examiners a hundred years into the future um, who give it a mark, uh, which is fine because I spoke to Joe Johnson. She's from. How is that? Educast. Educast, there you go. Sorry, it's not part of my world. Educast, which sounds like a gas company to me. Um, and or some kind of defense contractor, which maybe they are in another life, I don't know, but that, that may, that, that's not true. Scrubbed out from the video. Um, in case they are and they want to kill me. Not in case they're not, I don't care if it's false. I care if it's true and they want to kill me. Um, so, as they, so you've seen this probably, and then there's this extra stuff written down by examples where they try to flesh it out, as I said. Um, and and then so that filled me with horror because then you've got, I've got even more clearly written stuff telling me what I said in the past about a thing. And uh, as you can imagine, then you think, oh, did I say that? Or which bit of what I ever said have they picked out as the bit that's supposedly important? Um, and in fact, it turned out that was okay. The bits that they picked out that they thought that I'd said were more or less things that I'd said that I think it's okay for you to be say. So but it's a weird situation to be in. Uh, so this is, you've seen this, so it goes, the knowledge stuff goes media representation, media industries, media audiences, and there was another one before that wasn't the which I'll come to in a minute, and, and skills. Skills is separate. That's meant to raise a smile amongst you. I hope that raises a smile amongst <laughs> you. The skills sits quite apart from the knowledge. Skills can possibly be associated with knowledge. They sit at the end of the document where the minister has pushed them. Because um, apparently it really is this is what I learned from talking to Margaret, really is based on the spurious whims of ministers. I assume that like actual government ministers wouldn't have anything to do with things like this level of detail because they don't know anything. <laughs> um, but apparently that's not a thing that they're aware of, <laughs> which is of course the most dangerous thing in the world. We refer again to current and previous presidents of the United States. Um, so as it is, uh, it breaks down as language representation, industries and audiences and skills. Um, <laughs> A list which strikes me as essentially being from the 1970s. That's a picture in case you don't remember it. Even I, I wasn't born until that had started going, the 1970s. And I'm really old. So that was disappointing. Um, of course, in the 1970s, when Apple did exist, but his computers were made of wood. That's how long ago it was. They carved computers out of trees. <laughs> More or less. Um, so that's that. So, um, so I've just been slightly rude about that. And then I thought, uh, you might want me to suggest something more constructive. So although this is of no consequence because it'll never go anywhere, I would have done it like this. If you're thinking, well, how could you have done it better, David? I thought, oh, the language and representations, that's all right, but you could bundle them up in one because they're kind of the same thing. They're not quite the same thing. Representations is more visual and language is to do with language, as you may have guessed from the name. Um, you could bundle up industries and futures because industry is still really is a big thing. It's one of the old categories we've always talked about. Obviously, those industries which are part of and control and run those media which we use, which are different to the ones we were talking about 20 or 30 years ago, but they're still really big and important. But of course, the industries are different. Um, you talk about them and where that may lead, and you could have one that's about making a network, which basically doesn't come anywhere in that list. That list has audiences in it. I don't like audiences anymore. You can't talk about audiences. That's really sort of 1980s media studies, isn't it? Um, obviously, there are things, and those things have audiences, but it's a complex network of interactions and networks and things, isn't it? Which is a bit of what I'll be talking about in a minute. Um, so that was that. And so then there's this bit that I... So apparently this was published February last year, and I didn't know about that. And then in the summer, I got an email from somebody asking me what I thought about being part of this thing, and I didn't know what this thing was, and so I had to look it up. And so at that point, uh, that was the point which I discovered was mentioned in this thing. Of course, it says gauntlet, it's just one word. So it could be H.J. Gauntlet, who composed Once in World David City. <laughs> there aren't that many other gauntlets, so it's kind of closed off. But some of these other names, Hall, you could, you could dig out your own, or Vivekka Hall, she's fantastic. Could be that, doesn't say. Um, lots of the stuff in here is left to your imagination. Um, but here I'm written down as theories of identity, including, including Gauntlet, which I assume is because I did a book called Media, Gender, and Identity. I don't normally put my book covers into talks, but I was talking to Joe Johnson this morning and she said, I'll put in the book covers so they know which things you're talking about. So I put in the book covers during coffee. Um, so I did that book, which I know that some teachers have used media, gender, and identity. Um, 
in the past, which pleased me. Now I find it a bit spooky <laughs> and weird because that's from 2002 and the second edition is 2008 where I've mostly updated examples. It's about theories, which are kind of quite timeless ones. It talks about Giddens and Foucault and uh, some other people. Uh, it does talk about Judith Butler, who's one of the other theorists who are mentioned. And if, as you may know, if you try to read Judith Butler, that's not an easy task. Um, and I do like to think that one of the useful things I did in this book was to read Judith Butler on your behalf and translate it into the English language, which we use nowadays. Because um, Judith Butler's got some great ideas, and ideas that I think are quite simple and straightforward. But either because she was aware of that or not aware of that, she certainly wrote it down in some rather more difficult words. Um, so that, I guess this is why I'm written down for identity, but I don't, you know, that's a long time ago. 2002, what's that, it's 15 years ago now. That's a long time, the media's changed a lot. Any of the examples in that will leave students scratching their heads. Even in the most up-to-date, in the, in the specifications done by that gas company, um, well then, <laughs> as I'm going to call them, uh, they, they mentioned Zoella as an example, which seems you know, quite up-to-date, but if you've got students who are taking exams in 2019, Zoella would be something from look like the Maybe their older brothers and sisters know who Zuella was, but Zuella will be in the past by then, presumably. At least as a popular thing. I'm not saying anything bad's going to happen to her. That would be threatening and strange. <laughs> um, but, you know, sorry about that. Uh, yes, yeah, so that, was, that was my quandary around that. And as you can see, I don't have that much to say about it at first, but then I tried to piece together some things. Um, this is the bit about uh, the internet these days. So, um, in your charmingly oldie worldy media studies specification. You've got all kinds of uh, media that I, I can remember, like television and radio and things like that. Um, but it seems kind of weird, I don't know why I'm saying this to you, because it's a problem that perhaps you just share with me, but it seems we're mostly now aiming to teach our young people about the media use of their grandparents, as if that's a fascinating thing. And you know, a bit of history is good for all of us, but it's a bit weird. Um, obviously, most of the stuff that they do, that do and use these days, they're essentially doing it via the internet. When, we, you know, when you talk about television, do we count Netflix as television now? It's like that. I guess we kind of do, don't we? Because you can't be talking about television as like actual television, like for that, you know, that thing. <laughs> I won't explain to you what television is. But it seems strangely <laughs> distant now. Um, if when we're talking about television in the A-level and AS-level media studies, we're talking about sort of Netflix and those kind of platforms as absolutely part of television, I suppose that's, that's better than if you weren't. Though using the word television seems a bit odd because it's not but they're made in the same kind of way. It's weird, isn't it? You live in a weird time now. I sympathize. I also teach students, so we have to deal with these things, but we, we're not told what to teach by the government. That's the thing. Um, it seems really hard, I think, and not what you want at all. Why can't you teach interesting things that you choose to do? It'd be crazy, wouldn't it? Michael Gove wouldn't be having that back in the past, and, and now that'll never happen ever again. Um, so the thing about the internet, uh, the way I uh, like to get around the problems we have with this is by basically uh, explaining to people that basically the internet and you might, when you're talking about the internet, you're essentially talking about the world, you're not actually talking about the world, but they're both just like big massive things with good things and bad things in them. So it's hard to say, for example, positive things about people being creative online these days, because then people immediately go, oh yeah, but isn't Google abusing all of our data for evil purposes, which is kind of true, and isn't Facebook just gathering all of this? It's, now live in a kind of monopoly surveillance culture where everything we do is harvested by governments and industries, um, governments for surveillance and industries to make money from that data which you weren't intending to create when you were simply sending friendly messages to your friends or googling things about your interests. Um, so that's not great and you can talk about like online bullying and online hate and, and the way in which maybe the internet helped with the rise of things like Brexit and Donald Trump that we probably don't like. Um, or don't like, to put it another way, <laughs> if I can dare assume. Um, and, and so talking about the internet is hard now for those kind of reasons, because you say something positive about the internet, people say, oh yeah, but what about this thing? And, and so my way of getting around that is to point out that basically you do just have, it's like a pile of good things and bad things. So if somebody said, oh, I like living on planet Earth, it's quite nice, isn't it? And you immediately just said, yeah, but what about terrorism? I was like, it's like, or if someone said they're enjoying their birthday, and you said, yeah, but what about terrorism? It's like, what? It's not really a fair thing to throw at me, but they just said I was enjoying my birthday of all days, my birthday, don't even be happy. And they're like, no, terrorism's bad, Donald Trump's awful, uh, there's lots of misogyny around and everything's awful. And you know, those things aren't wrong though. Those are true statements. 
at the same time, personally enjoying their birthday, it's fine. Um, so it, it's like there is the pile of good things and the pile of bad things, and the good things do not make the bad things not true, and the bad things don't take away from the good things or make them unimportant. So you just have to accept that both of these things exist because the internet's unbelievably complicated and represents a lot of stuff happening in the world. It's like talking about the world. So you can't necessarily throw the bad things at the good things to show that the good things are not good because those good things still are good. You know what I mean? In the case of me, that comes up essentially because, as I said, I like to think about positive uses that we can have for new technologies, the ways in which we can use the internet to connect and share and to enable people to make things around things that they're interested in and enthusiastic about and share them with others and get those people inspired too. All of that, that's got to be good, hasn't it? And you can't then just go, oh, yeah, but what about cyberbullying? Because that's also a thing. But it's not a thing that takes away the thing that I just said. They're just different. So you've got piles of good and bad in the same place. Um, but the internet being an unbelievably massive thing, you can't just talk about it as a thing. It's lots of stuff, lots of things. In the same way that you never normally try to say a sentence about the world. Because you know, what can you say about the whole world? It's too big to talk about. So that's that bit. Good. Um, so this was a bit where I'm going to talk about the kinds of things that I like to talk about these days, which aren't necessarily the kinds of things that are written down on that National Curriculum document, which you don't call National Curriculum document, but I do. Um, I'm going to have to say that if that was out now. Uh, it's basically about making and creativity. Um, so we can start with Making is Connecting. My click will work. Yeah. Um, so I did a book in 2011 called Making is Connecting. That if I had to point people to any of my things, I would point them to this thing, I think it's the thing. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying it's great, I'm saying relative to things I've done, it's sort of up at that end of things. Um, you can judge for yourselves otherwise. But so that's what Making is Connecting is. And the subtitle says, The Social Meaning of Creativity from DIY and Knitting to YouTube and Web 2.0. I won't be using Web 2.0 not in the second edition that I'm doing now. I just call it social media now, which is basically the same. Um, but the things that are done deliberately there are throwing together DIY, sort of hands-on, woodworky, crafty kind of things, perhaps you might think of, and knitting, which is not really like being on a computer, with the more kind of technology end of things, uh, to, to indicate to the passing viewer that this is talking about connecting up all the different ways that people have been creative for a long time. Because of course, of course people have been creative for many millennia, and the internet came along quite recently, <coughs> and sometimes you read stuff about digital creativity and stuff, which seem to assume that people only started being creative in about uh, 1996 or something. Um, and that's clearly not true. So I say making is connecting for three reasons, which I'll do here. So the first one is just that making is connecting because uh, inevitably when you're making something, you put together ideas and materials to make something new. It's a very straightforward one. But making is connecting also because creativity almost always involves a social dimension where people, you might, you might share the thing you've made with somebody else, you might share it to them at least, you might be pleased to get some appreciation, you might give it as a gift. The thing you make might inspire somebody else uh, and then they go on to do more making and you can have some kind of making a conversation. There's almost always that social dimension. It is possible to be creative on top of a mountain without talking to anybody, but mostly it's not what we do. There's normally that sharing involved. Thirdly and most importantly, making is connecting because I think when you make stuff, when you feel more of a participant in the world, not just a consumer but a creator of stuff, and obviously I hope you've put together the obvious connections where, where people these days in the world can make and share lots of stuff digitally and it can be networked all around the world very easily, not necessarily seen by everybody in the world of course because that's difficult, but making stuff that can potentially be seen by you know, many hundreds, thousands or even millions around and about, and that we all have that power now. That is still a big thing and is important, I think. That difference between when you were teaching media studies 20 or 30 years ago, if any of you were, and it was just looking at stuff made by <laughs> an elite, basically. Those people have been lucky enough to be selected to work for particular publishers or broadcasters or movie companies, um, because they were the only ones who could make stuff and get it out there. The comparison between that and now is, is huge. And very significant, I think, in identity terms, affects how you can think about yourself in the world, because if you're in the world as a creator, you could be making that stuff that will be seen by others. That's really different from the past, which uh, you still have to talk about in media studies because the government makes you, where you've got this thing where there's you know, media industries over here who make, who can get called the media. I hate talking about the media. What is the media now? 
it worked in the 1980s. You talk about the media. You could hate the media, or you could like the media, or the media would be a thing you might want to work on. It existed over there, probably in that London. Um, <laughs> but now, what's the media in? Um, <coughs> I think I was in the middle of a thread there, which I forgot what it was, but never mind. Uh, just, just that huge difference. And the difference it makes to your sense of identity if you're able to participate in this world. I think it also, hopefully, ideally, helps with people's sense of participation and identity in terms of uh, feeling that you can make a difference in the world of politics, feeling like you can make a difference to the environment. If you're making things in the world, I think it changes how you think about yourself. So that would be sort of the key thing I would like to say about identity these days. And which isn't what they're thinking about when they write down theories of identity, including Gauntlet on that document, I think. But, um, but I think if you can stir in some of that, in having to talk about things that I've written, then that is the that's the more pertinent and up to date end of it, I guess. Um, in making is connecting to give you just a tiny taste. When I try to link up thing, uh, how people thought about creativity in the past, or what people have said about the meanings of creativity in the past, and what people do nowadays, which you can do in quite fruitful ways. For example, um, that's a embroidering woman in the 17th century and there's a good book by Rizika Parker called The Subversive Stitch which is all about women doing embroidery. It doesn't really sound like the kind of thing you might be reading if you're thinking about digital technologies now kind of thing. <laughs> but she talks about embroidery um, on the one hand as a marker of femininity like that's what embroidery is or has been certainly. It's a thing associated with women doing that particular draft. That's true but also as a weapon of resistance to the constraints associated with that idea. Um, where women can sort of carve out this space of time within their lives to be doing this project, it's their own project, a project they're taking from start to completion themselves, they've got, got power within that, a place for personal thought and self-expression. And there's this bit, for example, where Rosika Parker says this, the experience of embroidering and the embroidery, yes, I am going to read it out, affirms the self as a being with agency, the sense that you're doing this thing yourself, acceptability sort of to do with you in relation to others, and potency, the power to be making a thing in the world. You start with nothing, it turns into a thing. It's a potent kind of position to be in. The embroiderer sees a positive reflection of herself in her work, and importantly, in the reception of her work by others. And then if you change that over to something like people making videos for YouTube, or blogging, let's do blogging because it's just one word, then you get the experience of blogging and the blog affirms the self as a being with agency, acceptability and potency. So by being a blogger, you get agency because you can make this thing, acceptability because you're participating in a kind of online conversation about politics or about dogs or whatever it is that you're interested in, uh, and potency because you make this thing which appears in the world, so you've got a kind of power there. Um, not the same level of power as Rupert Murdoch or any of those old kind of media giants, of course, but it's a new form of power. It's on a different level, and if lots of people are doing this, it adds up to something. Uh, the blogger sees a positive reflection of herself in her work normally true, and importantly in the reception of their work by others, which is also part of why people do it. You know, I create a thing, it doesn't have to be blogging, it can be making videos on YouTube or any of that kind of activity, uh, it's seen by others, others may enter into a conversation with me about it, they might just like it, but at least I see that there's some kind of connection with the world there, and that's a powerful thing. Um, so in making us connecting, I kind of like the bits I like best are probably those bits where I'm trying to connect up things from the past with things from now. John Ruskin. Uh, the Victorian art critic kind of guy. Um, later in his life, he just gets excited about the power of making and the spirit of the maker. So he waxes lyrical, for example, about uh, medieval cathedrals where the, you have those gargoyles, which are just weird and kind of strange looking things. The reason medieval gargoyles appear on cathedrals is because they're essentially people engaged in a corporate project of building a cathedral. Um, but they're kind of licensed, allowed to add on these strange, quirky little things. They don't have to ask for permission. These craftspeople want to express something about themselves, and they can just kind of do it and add them on. Uh, and Muskin loves that, because you can see within them this mark of the maker. And I say, if you then take that over to videos on YouTube, for example, well then, you can again say, well, it's not fine art. It's not like properly made. If you're looking at homemade videos on YouTube and feeling disappointed that they don't look like BBC Two documentaries, then, you know, they're, they're, they're just not meant to be like that. They're meant to be kind of rough and personal uh, and made just because somebody's got a thing they want to communicate. That is why they are made. Sometimes it's because people are hoping to get rich eventually, but there's only a small number of people that can do that. Mostly it's people wanting to communicate, communicate a thing, because it's what they want to do, to a few friends, or maybe to a bigger community if they can develop one. 
and and within those things, you can see the mark of a maker, which is what makes it, makes it special, I think. That's what, why it's nice to browse around strange homemade videos on YouTube that plainly aren't made for you, just because you can see that there's people with passions trying to communicate things. Um, the Little Birdie in the Tree is just to remind me about how, like, if you come from a context, the context I work in is I work with other people who are interested in like broadcasting regulation and big sort of those big kind of macro media issues. And then I'm excited about somebody knitting a scarf, or making a funny video in, on YouTube, or singing a song, those kind of things, uh, which sound potentially banal and like nothing. But I think those things all add up to be quite a phenomenon. There's lots of everyday creativity online now, and people are adding to that and having conversations around that and building communities around that. It does add up to be a big thing. If you look at any of the bits, it can look trivial, but adds up to be quite a thing, I think. And that's where, again, then people start saying, yeah, but isn't the internet for this, bad for this reason, this reason, this reason? You have to say, yes, perhaps it is. But this is still good. People being creative, exchanging between each other, forming networks, having nice conversations, that does happen online and is good. The bad stuff, that's true too. Sometimes people try to put it into a kind of, is this right or is this right argument, where they, it's just kind of a ridiculous binary thing where either these critics are right because they're pointing out all the bad things about the internet or else, you know, it would have to be these people over here being right, but these people over here, including me, I never thought of as right because we're obviously technological determinists or um, some other kind of utopian something um, that you can use to dismiss people with. I'm not a technological determinist because that would mean that you were saying that because of this technology, then this thing's going to happen. And I, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't actually know many technological determinists. I don't know that many people that say, this technology, therefore this thing. That normally doesn't actually happen, but it's a buzzword used by people who want to shut people up. Um, I'll move along. So this is just a few more things that I like to talk about. So um, this is the idea of, if you think of media not as a channel for like, here's a message which goes into the media and then goes into the minds of an audience, that's your kind of old model, which of course we always question in various ways anyway. But if you think of it not like that or any variation of that, but media as a trigger for experiences and making things happen, that's the kind of idea that comes from Brian Eno which I mean, it's, it has an antecedents before that. But um, Brian Eno talks about art as a, as a trigger for experiences rather than it being a thing that's got like a channel for messages, but just something that will cause something else to happen in the world. I think that's quite a nice way of thinking about it. And in the light of that, oh yeah, here's my other wordy slide. This is a bit that I wrote, again, I put it in the book cover because Joe Johnson told me to. Um, that's not Joe Johnson, the brother of Boris Johnson, because I don't talk to him now. The nice Joe Johnson we've got here, wherever she is. Is she here? She, yeah. There she is. Right yeah, very sensible. <laughs> but she's not the brother of Boris Johnson. It's fine. Um, she's not the brother of Boris Johnson. Let's straight yeah. um, So I put this, this is like the one, this is the bit in Making Media Studies, so that book there, which uh, I was pleased with this bit, so I put a box around it, and it appears on page 17, so if somebody's browsing through it in a bookshop, they can work out which page is really good to just kind of rip out and stick in their pocket without having to buy the damn thing. It's this. Look at media as not as channels for communicating messages and not as things. We could look at media as triggers for experiences and for making things happen. They can be places of conversation, essentially anything where two people get to sort of have a, a thing like a conversation, it doesn't have to be a spoken conversation. Exchange. It's kind of the word I use instead of sharing because Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook has made the word share the most nauseating word in the world because he uses share to mean sticking a thing on Facebook. I don't know, it's okay with sharing. Sharing in the old use of it, you might remember from the ancient days before 2004 when Facebook was launched. Before 2004, then uh, sharing was this thing that people did together. It's like this person's kind of giving something of themselves to another person who appreciates it. It didn't mean, you know, putting a link to a music video on Facebook. That's not sharing a search, is it? It's just putting a link on Facebook. Um, so I've gone for ex exchange is imperfect too, though. Exchange also isn't the right word. Our language has been soiled by that Zuckerberg. Um, transformation suggesting some kind of better tomorrow that we could be leading towards that would be nice. Media in the world, I then said, um, is a fantastically messy set of networks filled with millions of sparks, some igniting new meanings, ideas, and passions, and some just fading away, which I kind of tried to draw a bit like that. So um, it's, it's sort of this idea that there's just so much now, isn't there? In the past, 
if you were teaching the media, even in 1995 or something, when there was a kind of set inventory of stuff that you might possibly be talking about. And it was big, because there were lots of films and television programs and things that existed. But if you had a really, really, really long time, you couldn't write them down. And now we're at a time where you couldn't possibly dream of ever writing all of the things down, because there's just millions of the things, and every day we're creating more of the things ourselves and spreading them around. Um, and so then you've got the question about like, well, which ones count now and what, what's important and which ones do we need to focus on. Um, and as a person who's making that stuff, when you're often putting out stuff and some of it seems to have a connection with people and maybe have a life afterwards and some of it just goes and it was a waste of time. Or, well, it wasn't a waste of time because I think you need to be putting things out there if you're a creator of stuff yourself, and you probably are, then um, you, know, you need to be making and sharing things and you, it's hard to know which things are going to be successful and which things are going to be interesting to people and which ones aren't, but it's kind of where we are now that you just need to be putting those things out and making them. And so some of them, as I, where's that thing on? Up there, sorry, back, 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 back. There we go. Um, that was the bit about some igniting new meanings, ideas and passions and some just fading away. You have to start accepting that thing where it's not all important and we don't have to worry about all of it. And it's hard to predict which things are going to turn out to be important. I suppose, which I try to draw like that, which is then very different from this is maybe the more traditional model where people spent some amount of time crafting a media product, which they then put out there, and then they started making another one, which again took a block of time, and then they put it out there, and so on, a much more linear process. Or even, um, uh, th this was this, emerged, this scribble emerged from when I was talking to a folk musician guy who was talking about, yeah, but what? when you have like a group of people who don't know each other and they come together in a pub and they're making folk music and they sort of create this swirl of thing together. And that's an interesting different kind of thing. It's not like the first model and the second model, it's more like that. But basically, online, in our media lives now, it's more like that, I think, that one. Um, so, a few more things. I think, I'll speed up a bit. I like to talk about platforms for creativity, which is events or digital platforms or things, tools, toys, which give people the opportunity to be creative in their lives. And so these can take many, many forms. Um, it can be the ways in which people are rethinking libraries and museums these days, perhaps, as places where people do stuff rather than just going to access previously existing expertise. It would include something like Minecraft, which I saw interestingly is written down as a case study on the OCR. I think it's the OCR one. Um, and in the OCR, I read this this morning, in the OCR specification for media studies, it mentions Minecraft and it talks about it in terms of representations and audiences, I think. And audiences is really weird in relation to video games, because do video games have an audience? I don't, don't use the word audience. <laughs> it doesn't seem quite right, does it? And it's literally because of trying to apply these kind of 1970s categories, which were set before you had to then start picking examples, to the examples. So again, I. I sympathise with the difficulty of trying to wrangle today's media world into these weird old categories that have been set out in a government document. Um, and in work that I've been doing uh, with uh, different partners, including ones that don't appear to be certainly on screen based things like Lego or the Crafts Council, thinking about how you can create more of these opportunities for people to, creative, to be creative. And I think it's interesting to think about the links between digital stuff that we can't always talk about and other ways in which people can be creative and can express themselves and can try to make a difference in the world. So I've been relatively quick on that. You could summarise all of it as being basically about conversations, inspirations and making things happen. Conversations about people connecting and having some kind of shared experience of communication. Inspirations I think we don't talk about much or enough because I think in today's media world there's a lot of interesting stuff about how people can kind of scaffold each other's uh, passions and expertise and things they're interested in so that one person does a thing and then somebody thinks, oh, that's interesting, they did that, I could do a thing like that. And they're not copying or doing any kind of plagiarism or anything like that, but they're just kind of inspired to see that somebody does this thing, so I could do this thing. And then somebody else over here might be like, I did that, so then I could do this. And there's an interesting kind of ladder of creativity that does occur, not always, um, but does occur and is interesting. And this ability for people to make things happen in the media world, which we have now, which people didn't have before. I discovered this quote from Kevin Kelly recently. It's from about 2008, in fact. Um, but I think it's an interesting way of thinking about this sort of stuff, too, um, and the digital world in which we live. So this question, he starts off by saying, the internet is a huge copying machine, that's what it does, which is a fact. The internet just copies data from place to place to place, that's what it does. 
But also more meaningfully, perhaps you're, you're well aware of the fact that it's just so easy to copy digital stuff now, and it gets passed around, pirated, if you want to use that word, or it's just so easily shared. And if you're thinking about kind of anything that can be downloaded, it just becomes, especially young people, as you know, treat it just like a thing that should be free, or should be able to access any of that. Um, so then Kevin Kelly asks, how do you create things of value, in particular things that you could sell? If anything can be copied indiscriminately and just kind of downloaded, and he thinks the answer, is that the things that become valuable are things that cannot be copied. I thought it was an interesting way of putting it. Um, that doesn't just mean the things that are of value are now not the, are now the things that aren't digital, because you can have real-time digital experiences, which are things that you, you can't just download and get. They're real-time digital experiences. It could be just an online conversation we're having. It could be people playing a multiplayer game. It could be people participating in some future digital drama scenario that we haven't even imagined yet. Um, those are things that can't just be copied. And passed around easily and therefore being of no value. Um, it's an interesting thing to think, I think, about what would these things be like in the future, what possible things can we conceive of um, where things have value for people and they're willing to pay money for them because they're not just stuff you can download. Um, kind of classic example of that is like on Kickstarter where people are trying to raise funds for their creative <laughs> thing. If you've looked at Kickstarter you typically get, like if somebody wants to make an album, well then they're raising money to be able to make this album and then People who've given five dollars might be able to just download the album. The download of the album is the cheapest, uh, the thing with least value, indeed. And then you go down through other things that people might pay money for, and you might be like, forty dollars, you can have the nice box set of a physical copy of the thing, and fifty dollars, it might be vinyl and come with some stickers and some toys or objects or something. Uh, going up to maybe a hundred dollars to get you the chance to go to a concert where you're with other humans in the same room as your favorite artist. And then $2,000, you get to sit down and have lunch with your favorite artist. And that's the thing that some people might be willing to do because it's a very real experience, an experience that you might talk about for the rest of your life. Um, whereas the music, $5, download it. That was the thing which in the, in the past, the music was the thing, wasn't it? People paid the money for the music and that was the most exciting thing. But music has become kind of devalued in that way because we just expect, uh, we'll download that, get it off YouTube, don't need to spend money on that. So then, as you know, you've seen this happen, Artists have to make money in different ways. Um, so it's interesting, I think, if you're talking with students about if they want to be players in this media sphere in the future, if they think of a kind of DIY career, how are they going to turn that into money? Things like this are worth talking about. Because the old ways of making money just didn't work, as you know. I'm nearly in now, don't worry. Um, this is about the, the long tail. So you may have talked about the long tail, because the idea of the long tail has been around for about 10 years, when Chris Anderson did a book called The Long Tail. Um, maybe 12 years by now. Um, long tail looks like that, you know about the long tail? Okay, um, the idea of the long tail is that this is products, stuff that goes along here and that goes on and on and on and on and on. And this is their level of popularity. So in the past, when there was a small number of products, that's the small band up there, which it was worth putting into a shop, um, and which therefore we could access or put into a library or people could get, there's a small amount of that, and you couldn't get hold of anything else that might exist in the world. You didn't even know it existed. And ever since online stores came along and downloads, I guess, and online platforms, well then you can just have endless stuff. The stuff goes on and on and on and on and on. Most of it is not popular. But if you're, say, Amazon, you make just as much money from selling all of this stuff, books and CDs and things that mostly nobody wants. You make just as much money from selling that as you do from selling the things that apparently everybody wants, the big hits. Um, Ditto for iTunes, say, or anything. They make just as much money from things that mostly never sell as they do from the things that really, really sell. But there's a small number of small number of those things, and a massive number of millions of those things, which add up to a similar amount of value. Um, so since that idea was public, I, I quite like that just because it's um, it basically unlocks and celebrates all of this stuff. So it's not just about the big hits and the mainstream stuff. It's about everything else. It's things that are experimental and weird. By definition, when anything cool is probably somewhere down there because it becomes uncool when it goes up there. Um, so I like that. Over more recent years, when the whole idea of the long tail has been kind of shot down and people go, yeah, but you said like it was going to be the end of hits, but we've got bigger hits than ever. Uh, Hollywood, for example, just putting lots of resources into mega massive hits, you know, the Marvel Universe and all those kind of things. They just put ever more resources into a smaller number of things that they're really, really sure are going to be hits. Um, 
So, it, it, so it's a hits culture, it's not a long tail culture. But I don't think that's, that's not really true because the whole idea of the long tail was always that you would still have hits. You always have hits. There's always things that are popular at a particular moment in time. That's kind of inevitable. But at the same time, it's about the power of everything else. I like it just because, this reason, it's always good, I think, to have lots of interesting creative things. That's always going to be better than just having a small number of popular polished things. And I guess I end up writing this down because there's still people kicking around in the world and media studies and other places who seem to be kind of wishing that we didn't have this mess of stuff. There's so much stuff. How do you deal with all this stuff? It's so messy. Lots of it is very unprofessional. Um, I can't understand that complaint because I like all of that stuff because it's the interesting stuff, isn't it? Um, you do, of course, get interesting popular stuff too. But all of that stuff in the long tail is basically, it makes the world a more interesting place, I think. So I want to stick up for that. So that was that. So I'm nearly at the end and we can do the Q&A bit, which goes on until half past three. So we're doing all right time-wise. Um, but I wanted to return at the end then to try to force myself to then link up what I've been talking about with this. Uh, so this bit for me, and I realise it seems weird this all just focused on me and what I said, which isn't what I'd normally be talking about. But uh, in this context, I know that media studies teachers keep sending me emails going, what's the thing you said about the thing? And I have to try to explain what, what it was that somebody thought I said about a thing. Um, so I'm trying to do that here. In terms of theories of identity, which comes under the section of representation. These aren't the words that I'd be using. I think of representation as being like the old media studies word, which, taught, which is about like how things are represented in the media. And it was kind of straightforward back then, wasn't it? You could look at the media and you could see how certain groups were mostly represented. And it was kind of straightforward and interesting. Um, and that doesn't really work so well these days, because if you say like, oh, how are women represented on Facebook? So it's like, what? what? <laughs> Um, it's just such a massive thing. Again, it's like trying to talk about the world. It's like saying, how? What are women like in the world? It's not, it's, not, it's, not a quest, it's not a meaningful question. It's just like there's lots of different things is the answer. Same as what are men like in the world? What are cows like in the world? You know, it's just like, it's, I can't quite tell you. It's just very, very complicated. Um, but it, it, it's still what we're being asked to do if we are being asked to talk about representations of things in today's media. Um, I guess you can essentially cheat and just go, Okay, that's an interesting question, and we're going to talk about what happens on BBC One or something. But, you know, most of your students probably don't know that much about BBC One. They've, they've heard about it, whispered about on street corners, that kind of thing. And, Where, where'd you get it? I don't know. Uh, I think it's on those boxes that people used to have in their homes. Um, you could cheat by doing that, but then again, you're getting your students to write about their grandparents' media use, which doesn't seem very helpful. So I, I, so, I don't really know about that, but in terms of what this connects with me, identity. That's okay, because I think I do have things to say about identity. Because the whole thing about being able to be creative and the way in which that makes a difference to how you are in the world, that's absolutely about identity. And it's to do with representation, because it's people are creating these representations when you create content for YouTube, or even when you tweet or whatever, they're all representations. And my interest in them is to do with identity. So actually, after all of this agonizing and thinking, oh God, what are they talking about here? Um, uh, actually, uh, that, that is okay, and does link to what I'd like to talk about nowadays. You've still got the problem of, what if they want your students to be writing about what I said in 2002? But I talked to Joe Johnson, once again, uh, uh, from the gas company, and she said that, uh, <laughs> which abuses me to keep saying that, um, and she said that they do say to their examiners, and it's written down in their book, that if uh, students are able to sort of bring in newer things, if they're able to bring in like new research, new perspectives, or if they're able to say, for example, that David Gaunt did talk about identities like this in 2002, but more recently he's talked about how people can be more empowered by uh, creating their own stuff, making their own representations, because the phrase self-representation does appear even in the most basic government document, this one, um, before it's even fleshed out by everybody else, then that is good and students should be rewarded for that. So that's the relief. So it, I, otherwise my fear is that any of the named people in this, like me, uh, just have to be kind of ossified or set in aspects that we don't start saying new things because that would ruin everything. Um, or, or, or that you would all very reasonably gang up and kill us to stop us from saying anything new, which would be convenient and logical for you, but awkward for me. I do have family members who would be quite cross, I think. I haven't checked, but I think likely. Um, so the good news is that we are allowed to actually include newer ideas, newer things that people have said beyond the point that the government is kind of probably talking about in the things that they've said. Um, 
although it's never clear what thing they're talking about anyway. As you know, you look at these things, this is the experience of media studies I, I teaches, I believe, so you look at these things about, you know, the theories of Bell, you don't even know like which book they're talking about. Bell Hooks said some good things in the 1960s, and the 1970s, and the 1980s, which kind of one are you thinking about? Uh, these things do change. There was a thing where um, Michel Foucault was criticised at a point in his late, he died in 1984, but he was criticised, I think, in the, in the early 80s, because he was saying things in some lecture which were different to things that he said sort of 15 years earlier. And so someone thought they'd be really clever by taking him to task about this and saying, yeah, ha -ha, but you said this thing before, and now you say this. But what Michel Foucault said was, do you think I've been working really hard all my life to say the same thing? Ridiculous. Obviously, he's working and learning and developing new ideas and dealing with the world as he finds it to come up with something newer and better. You're not meant to always be saying the same thing. But that makes life very difficult when you get ideas presented as hooks or Paul, as if it's a single thing that you can just learn that chunk and tell it to a student. So that's hard. So, for me, look, this is the last slide. Um, I thought I'd just try to write it down, and if you want this, I'd put it also on Twitter. You may not be a Twitter user, but you can just go to twitter.com slash David Gauntlet, and you'll be able to find this at the top of things. Uh, I was trying to write down what are the most basic points, which are things from me, which come on, would come under theories of identity, to do with representation, from me, which are the newer things I've been talking about. So it's about people having a route to self-expression, and then I'm going to have to read it out, because I wrote this down so that it was kind of simple and clear. People having this kind of route to self-expression and therefore a stronger sense of self and participation in the world through making and exchanging. That's about identity and representation, but it's newer stuff. It's not the 2002 stuff or stuff from the 1990s. Um, the idea that media, which is stuff these days made by all of us, being places of conversation, exchange and transformation. There's the thing about the messy set of networks filled with millions of sparks, some igniting new meanings, ideas and passions, and some just fading away. You remember when I talked about that about 29 minutes ago? Um, that one. The need for better for platforms for creativity, which are places where people can make and share and exchange things and ideas and representations. Um, there's lots of problems with the current ones, but the current ones do enable you to do these things. Again, it's the good things, bad things thing. Uh, there's many problems with Facebook and the way in which it monetizes your private data and all of that. And the way in which Google and Facebook in particular, you can read the very good, there's a good new book by Jonathan Taplin, you can get it for about £15 probably on Amazon, called Move Fast and Break Things. Move Fast and Break Things, it's a mantra within Facebook. And it's all about how they've essentially sucked $50 billion of money out of what was previously the creative economy and just kept it as advertising revenue. So all of the money that used to be spent on supporting artists and enabling some people to build up an artistic career in music or film or whatever, it's just been absolutely sucked out of the world by these platforms which just take it as money from advertisers instead, having led people to realize they don't need to pay for creative stuff anymore because they can get it for free online. Um, and it's a, it's a remarkable thing that's happened that we tend not to think about too much. People like me certainly don't think about that too much. I love the idea of the, the early idea of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee's idea of the internet, which is just a really nice, creative, making, sharing space. I like to hold on to the idea that we can still do that. And it has increasingly been subverted, in particular by Google and Facebook. And I, I used to think fondly of Google. I remember when Google was this story of these cool guys who uh, were, were fighting the big, you know, you had big, companies that were trying to move into the internet then and, and Google came in like these, you know, they're just these a couple of geeks who'd done this crazy amazing search engine that was much better than the existing ones and it wasn't full of advertising and all this stuff. Uh, so I was fond of Google then and it's hard to shake off the idea that they're these crazy new interesting geeks, but they're really not these days I'm afraid. As you probably know, better than me. Um, last bit, still the idea of people building their own sense of identity. So it's like, it is about, if, if you happen to know the kind of things I was talking about in media general identity, and those are the bits that are picked out in the, the gas company specification, um, which are about people creating a sense of identity through using media products. It's still like that, but the media products aren't things that they're getting off the shelf now. The media products are things that we can all make ourselves. So it's through individual creativity rather than through selecting particular magazines or TV shows that identity is built through everyday creative practice. Of course, it's complicated, and it's several things all at once, but that's basically it. Uh, and that's certainly a way in which you can turn those old ways of talking about the media into the new ways of talking about media, and apparently your students are still allowed to get marks for that, so that would be good. So uh, I will stop talking, thank you for that, and we'll do our Q&A next. We're going to sit down. I'm going to sit with my back to the wall, I've been told.
very good, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I've written some stuff to have. Um, I'll start with a couple of questions, and then we'll open it out if uh, they're not the kind of questions that you want to, <laughs> want to ask. I you don't like Mark's questions. Yeah, yeah, you, can, you, can, you can put some of your own on Twitter. Um, so uh, here's a, the first thing, um, which is about that you call that a slight kind of utopian tinge, um, more than slight, uh, to the to the foregrounding of kind of positive outcomes for self-expression and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was a bit of negativity at the end, which I liked. That's good, you know. A bit of um, uh, it, it is the this. The thinkers always like <laughs> the negative stuff, don't they? Is this what? So that, that my my thing is media studies. There's one version of looking at media studies, which is it's kind of premised on the somebody said the hermeneutic of suspicion, aka. Um, a friend of mine who said the Socialist Workers' Party told, told me one thing, when I watch the news, I say, why are these bastards telling me these lies, right? So that, so media studies has got this kind of suspicious um, origin, um, for, for good and fine reasons. Are you, uh, is, are you working in, in opposition to that, um, in, in the kind of, in the slightly kind of boosterist notion about the, creative, the opportunities that digital media yeah. offer for creativity? I think it's just Well, you're different. just a sunny kind of guy. <laughs> I do like to be optimistic about it. I, there, was, there was a thing a few years ago where I found myself saying, I haven't said it recently, but I found myself saying basically I've started to feel like it's my job to point out the positive things that we could be doing with new technologies because there's already a lot of people making good Same points, difference. making good points, not wrong points, good points about mm -hmm. the, all the potential negatives and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, the downsides of the internet and the ways in which companies have captured power on the internet and the ways in which you get filter bubbles, all there's many different negative things you can talk about about the internet, but there's people doing that. So I thought it was worth having me <laughs> and one or two others uh, pointing out things that actually are good, that I think are undeniably good, and is, they just exist at the same time. The good things and the bad things are both true. Is it, so. and is it even, I mean, just, just thinking about different platforms and the, um, and the kind of temperament of different platforms, Twitter becoming more and more accepted as being the trolls medium. It's, you know, it's where you slag people off. Instagram, everything's sunny, everybody's liking and, and sharing and saying fantastic. Uh, is, is, is that, can, it, can, can you have a kind of temperament attached to a platform like that? Do, do they attract different kind of people or different kind of behavior? Well, well that would be to assume that it's true. But uh, <laughs> I, I think you associate ideas with, if, if you say that a, a drama is a bit ITV, you all know what that means. It doesn't yeah. actually mean anything in particular. And it's not because they've written down some codes of practice or something. But there's something about it. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I know what you mean by those characterizations. I like Twitter. I feel sorry for Twitter that, well, then, do I feel sorry for Twitter? I'm sad that Twitter has this reputation, but the reputation isn't wrong because there's yeah, lots of crap things that happen on Twitter. And Twitter, the company, should have done more, should have done much more to clamp down on that because it's such a, there is a horrible cesspit of people being horrible. I never see that because if, you, if you're on Twitter talking with interesting people that you know yeah. about interesting things, you, don't, you can just ignore it. Again, it's both, and because it's the size of, it's not the literal size of the world, because it's like the world, it mirrors the world, there's nice people there's and nice people. Nice people. Yeah. People doing good things and people doing bad things. It's true. Um, <laughs> and my second question uh, came almost from the, from the very beginning. Can we really do away with audiences, the notion of audience as a concept in media studies? Um, is it just that, I mean, is it now impossible to talk about um, groups of people who do broadly similar things with media in media, or is it that, that there's something wrong about audience because it suggests consumers not makers. Is it because people become individualised in their behaviour, or is it because the behaviour in relation to media has changed? Good question. Um, it is all of these things, I guess. The reason, partly I'm just bored of it. I used to be kind of an audiences person, and so then I got bored of that because I get bored of things. But um, as I said, obviously audiences do exist. Things have audiences. You know, House of Cards on Netflix has an audience, and it's a very straightforward relationship where some elite other people make House of Cards, and some other people, a much larger body of people, watch it on their iPads or whatever. Um, and that is still true. So you can still talk about that. It just seems relatively. I think there's not much interesting new that you can say about it. So uh, if you've got my job, you're meant to be saying interesting, interesting new things, new about things, these things. Different, different things. And I don't think there's much interesting that's been said about audiences in that very broadcaster and audience way mm. for the past, there's nothing really new we could have said in the past 20 years and I don't think we have. Um, so, it, so it's kind of old and boring. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just to dismiss it out of hand. Yeah. Um, um, should we, let, 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 I mean, let's look into the audience and see whether that, that audience, people want this to, audience people, exists. People, yes, yes. Well, yes. Well, if audience. they want to participate and talk about the, the concept of the audience. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> let's look into the souls of people. <laughs> Somebody's got 
question there. Yeah, hi. Um, you, although you've already mentioned, Mark, that the uh, use of like 1.0, 2.0 has become quite antiquated, the, um, I've read a few articles recently that's still using 3.0 to describe the internet um, and was wondering what your view on web 3.0 is because um, that's getting a lot of that's getting a lot of kind of conspiracy theory and negative views uh -huh. yeah. i think different people talk about different versions of what they think 3.0 is um so i'll ask you what you think it is in a moment i uh, i talked about web 2.0 just because it seemed to be talking i mean the numbers are essentially a bit stupid aren't they uh, and you always had to explain to people it wasn't like a sequel to the internet and it wasn't like different it was this, you're literally talking about the same thing you're talking about the difference between web 1.0 as you might call it and web 2.0 they're all things that happen with the same technologies it's things that happen you, you know you access on a electronic device using a web browser but the 2.0 term was about people being able to collectively do things on platforms together as opposed to the previous thing where people had to just individually make their own website basically um, and then 3.0 is not a follow-on from them either. It's the, it's, it's, I think it's normally the idea of the semantic web, where basically all of the information on the internet knows what it is and is able to sort of, like potentially AI can then mm. use that data to create new things that weren't, maybe weren't even made by humans. Is that what we think it is? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so I think in the context of what, you, what you've spoken about, I was thinking that what, from what I've read that would make the most relevance with, with what you've talked about is the idea then that those spaces that you're creating and making and sharing in are increasingly kind of uh, constructed and curated by the internet itself. Mm. So it's sort of, there's this almost censorship that the internet is potentially doing to point you in the right direction, but also perhaps restrict your, uh, okay. the space that you're in. Yeah. Which then points back to, in a sense, more understandable things that we may have heard about before, about sort of the filter bubbles and the way in which algorithms steer your behavior and that kind of thing, um, which are interesting, but, um, I'd like to just deal with them as a particular line of issues rather than talking about it being the idea of one, two, three, it doesn't, it especially doesn't work by that point because that's just part of that and that's part of that as well. Uh, but those, those are interesting things and um, and we do live uh, in an online world increasingly driven by algorithms and things that are trying to learn as much as they think they can about what we want to see so that they can then show us more of that as it were with adverts next to it to make more and more money for Facebook etc. Um, and you potentially ha end up with a culture which isn't that diverse and interesting and experimental because those things would never be pointed to you because you know my computer already knows that I like the Pet Shop Boys so it's going <laughs> to give me loads more things that sound like the Pet Shop Boys and not actually any new interesting music. Um, except you know then algorithm people go oh we know that so we always stir in like two things you're comfortable with and then one thing that's quite surprising and just uh, it's fine. Uh, but you never see the surprising things strangely. Yeah. Yeah. Who else has got that back on the question? Down the front. Mr. Jones. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I've sometimes described uh, media studies as teaching kids about something that they already own. And um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, thinking about everyday creative practice, what do you think uh, the role is for educators and for schools in this? Because you know, in some senses, I kind of think, shouldn't we just leave it alone and let people get on with things? Or, or do schools and educators and, you know, the education system have a role to play in developing creativity? I'm, I'm quite ambivalent about it. Mm, that's a very good question. So on the one hand, and this uh, does, does not serve me, but serves those other more negative people who write interesting things about the internet, I think there is a role for us to help them to understand how these platforms that they're using work and how they make money and all of that, and the power that they have and the way in which they're very tight with governments and the way in which they manage to become monopolies and even if you're in favour of capitalism, capitalism doesn't really work once you've got massive monopolies and, and lots of people who believe in capitalism are still very, very focused on making sure we don't have monopolies that kind of ruin innovation and just suck all the money out of the system. So all of that level of detail, I think that's really worth teaching to students, especially because, you know, you know I, I get them when they're 18 and, and you ask them if they know how Google works, and of course they know how Google works, but as soon as you start telling them anything about how Google works, they're like, whoa, really, what? <laughs> they can't believe it. They just thought it was this magic thing that you type words into and it showed you the things you were interested in because it's so clever. Um, and, and you've probably experienced some of that. Um, so, so helping students to understand these tools that they're using, I think is, is probably more important or at least as important as in the past where you were just looking at stuff 
Um, so as well for that, and also in terms of helping them to think about their own creative practice and the kind of art school approach to it, where to get them to be doing more interesting things. So you know, there's a lot of YouTube videos that basically all look the same, and those people who want to uh, become YouTube stars will start making videos that are very similar to each other, and and helping them to do that kind of thing more creatively, or any of the other digital creative stuff they do, whether it's music or whatever. That's a really good role for us. There's the kind of creative side and there's the critical side, and both of those, as it turns out from what I just said, that was persuasive. They're both as important as as ever, and probably more so, because you if you need them to be more interesting creators, if they're all going to be creating, you don't just want loads of mush that all looks the same as everything else. You need them to be more creative and interesting, and also you need them to understand what they're doing and how people might potentially want to be making money out of this that they're not going to see any of, and so on, and and the effects that this kind of network culture can have on a society and how we think and talk about things. So all of that is still all good. Hooray! <laughs> Media studies still do it. Still has a yeah. reason for being. <laughs> Round here. Mine's actually not a very serious question, but um, you did make me think when you said about Minecraft, and um, I don't know if you've seen the program Stampy. Mm -hmm. um, I, which, uh, I have a nine-year-old boy. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. Got Stampy covered by ears. Yeah, yeah, and uh, my husband's grandchildren just sit there and watch it. It's like someone's, you know, drugged them. And, uh, uh, and the man's got the most stupid laugh I've ever heard, and I could, just can't, couldn't uh, think of the appeal at all. And, uh, and now I'm wondering if it's meant that sharing of the creativity, and then, then thinking about how they can then go and recreate something and change it and make it new, as you said. And the other question is, bearing in mind your work with Lego, are you going to see the DC Lego uh, <laughs> exhibition, Lego superhero exhibition? Okay, I'll do the second one first. If that's those big kind of sculptures made out of Lego, is that what it is? I've no I idea. Those. I just I saw it, it when I was here, and I wondered if that, you know, you planned your afternoon around that. No. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Uh, I like things that in inspire creativity and which sort of can be done by everyday people. And the, you do get these big exhibitions of, like, massive Lego scenes made by people, and it takes them, like, 100 people, 100 days to make these things. I have no interest in that, and I don't even like looking at those things just because it's... It's kind of, it, I don't think it inspires creativity because it's just kind of intimidating to look at it. Like, Whoa, I could never make a thing, this sort of big, massive, ridiculous thing. So uh, I like Lego as a thing that people can touch and feel and play with on a base, you know, small, crunchy, <laughs> handheld level. So that's the answer to that one. The first one, Stampy, you see. So um, that's an interesting thing to talk about, actually. So for those of you who don't know, I, I guess we're talking about Stampy and the other people online like this who are essentially the dismissive way, which I caught a bit of in what you're saying, is you're just watching people play video games. Yeah. That's what that's what you're doing. And oh my God, how can all of today's children be just sitting around watching other people play video games? That does sound dreadful. I hate the sound of sitting around watching videos of other children playing video games. That's ridiculous. But actually, um, they're, they're very creative things. The ones who are successful, like Stampy and others, they're essentially they're intelligent, funny people, like other intelligent, funny people you'd like to watch yourselves. Uh, and they happen to express their creativity and humour through doing stuff within a video game world. But, but they're, they're being creative and interesting. So it, you, you may, in your own experience of watching television, say, you might watch somebody standing up at a microphone being funny and you think that's good because they're being creative and interesting and they're saying things with their mouths. Um, but the people who are doing this video game stuff, they're also creative and interesting people saying funny and interesting things with their mouths. Uh, they happen to be doing it whilst playing a video game at the same time. But I think it's not just watching other kids play video games. I'm not having a go at you for maybe no, it's having his said laugh. that. Not... It, it's his laugh. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's the, <laughs> it's the most irritating laugh I've ever heard in my life. You <laughs> may think that. But when my son was watching Stampy this very morning over breakfast. Um, don't judge me for the fact that he's... Oh, uh, God, now you're going to judge me for the fact he's watching that over breakfast. Um, we're busy people. Uh, I have to that. Um... Uh, and that was Stampy and his girlfriend Squashy, and you get quite a nice model of a young man <laughs> and a young woman collaborating, having fun together, being nice to each other, being collaborative in a thing which happens to be a video game. And I think I thought to, I thought to myself literally as well. I think oh, this is quite a nice model of a relationship between a young man and a young woman <laughs> being friendly and being nice to each other and collaborating and making each other laugh. It's actually quite nice compared to other things. You know, there's a wide range of other things your children might be watching, which are. You know, just angry fighting things or whatever, you know, good versus evil, noisy, nasty things. Stampy and Squashy playing Minecraft is the very definition of sweet. <laughs> you did raise them and dismiss the notion that video game might have an audience. 
That's the, the word audience. The, that's, the, the, it, oh, right. there they do yeah. have an audience. Yeah. Well, yeah, but that's different. Well, <laughs> that, that's <laughs> an audience for humorous videos which happen right. to be employing but, the people who are video games. Yeah. Right. It's just the word audience doesn't seem yeah. right for it does it, play, not, not for playing. It? No, not yeah. for playing. Yeah. But at the same time, people do watch. You know, they, they, they play games together and they all, and part of that process is watching you know, whoever's next to you play. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, there's a... There's oh, also the fact that some games are uh, often labelled as becoming more cinematic these days, mm -hmm. becoming more like a mm -hmm. movie. So, uh, for some video game players and some video game makers, maybe they're noticing that some of them have more of an audience mm -hmm. than the players. I, I just remember for, uh, having a son who played a lot of FIFA and me never being remotely interested in playing FIFA but actually quite liking watching him play because you know if it's done well it's, sometimes it's better than England I mean that's not saying <laughs> 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 so it has, it's a, has an audience appeal who else has got a, a question? Hi it's um, Joe Johnson Boris Johnson's ah. brother from the gas company um, Give him our love uh, I certainly will absolutely um, thanks David I hope you don't mind I'm just going to rather than ask a question just sort of respond to a couple of things if that's yeah. okay just to offer some reassurances hopefully to yeah. teachers who have got to use the specifications that are now published um, and maybe to you as well hopefully um, so just to say that obviously although we did uh, within the subject content and therefore within the specifications um, have to structure things in a certain way to put some kind of order and, and structure on a mass of content um, actually um, Obviously, we know when we're teaching media studies, a lot of those areas are—they are all, all obviously interrelated. Um, so, for instance, although um, you're uh, you're listed for theories of identity, um, identity also comes up in the subject content and therefore in the specifications under um, audiences, for instance, because it talks about the way that audience um, identity affects audience responses. Uh, but it also talks about uh, audiences as producers. It's very much part of the very definition of audience in the subject content. Um, it um, talks about self-representation. Um, so, you know, I think hopefully it's to reassure teachers um, that, you know, they don't just have to refer to your theories of identity in questions on representation. Hopefully good candidates will be able to make links between um, the different areas of the specification. And an audience is really just a broad heading that is used to include traditional audiences, like the ones that do turn up to the BFI to watch films, which after all could still be seen as an audience, I think. Um, and, and also more uh, contemporary conceptions of audience and users and audiences as producers. So I think the other thing is obviously media studies is, is a discursive subject and um, you know, constructing a discursive response is very much what learners being credited for. Um, so we would encourage them to debate questions around to, we, to what extent can we still talk about audiences, how active are audiences today in constructing their own identities, etc, etc. Um, we certainly, I don't, can't speak for any other uh, awarding body other than the gas board, um, but we would never ask a question like how are women represented on Facebook because that would be a nonsense. Um, we would ask something more meaningful uh, to do with online media. So it's about taking the bits of the concepts that are relevant and meaningful in relation to the media form that's being studied. Um, I think I'd also probably question the notion that television doesn't exist anymore as well. That's just my opinion. I think also possibly um, the woman that did the speech the other day who was the uh, head of Channel 4 and previously the head of the BBC might, might share that view. So, you know, it may be, it, it, it's, it's sort of semantic issues around whether we're talking about it as a platform. Ooh something telling me to shut up um, it's, it's whether we think of it as a platform or a form or whatever but but clearly you know <laughs> there is sort of something still that we might think of as television I think anyway so I'm only saying that to, to sort of reassure people hopefully that it's not all as bleak as it might seem in, in, in uh, the new specs yes I am aware that television exists yeah. my parents watch it yeah. <laughs> so do I and I'm not uh, quite that old I, uh, uh, yeah, I uh, but it's weird like what I don't even know what we call television now like uh, if you, like you know the thing about Netflix or, or Amazon Prime or those kind of things yeah. do we just yeah. always count them in as television is that yeah the definitely uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> but obviously we, television is essentially it? a debt for but I like to say these things to upset people <laughs> yeah. it does exist okay. but <laughs> once upon a time before we had theories and we had, before that we had key concepts originally if there wasn't originally we had 
a set of um, conceptual questions or signpost questions, which seem to be a much better, a much kind of more flexible kind of pedagogy. Instead of saying there are these things in boxes that you have to learn and then reproduce, there was this notion that you'd have a set of questions around uh, around you know the, the behaviour of groups of people in relation to media, which could be which is now called audiences. So uh, opening those out into questions is a way of engaging and making it more discursive. I think yeah. in the in the way that Joe's, Joe's describing, yeah. that's what te that, that's what teachers do. That's what teachers do in classrooms anyway. Mm. Have we got um, we've got time for one more question? If somebody. Um, was itching to... They were all good points and clarifications from Joe. Yeah. One more question? I think that means tea it's time. It's Does that mean tea time, time or yes. coffee time, depending on your choice of beverage? Um, can we say thank you very, very much again? For this? Thank you.